Hello and welcome to the Joe's Art History Podcast, a podcast which celebrates all things art historical every single day. This week we're saying lights, camera, action to episode 16. This week illustrator Nicole McLaughlin aka Nicopaws is back and I sit down with her to talk about six famous works of art which have made special cameo appearances in some of Hollywood's biggest and best loved movies. From boy wizards and frozen swings to holiday romances and sinking ships. Try and stop yourself from proclaiming as if at the number of incredible works of art Nicole and I point out that have made appearances in some of the world's most iconic films. And you really won't believe the amount of art that you really do miss hidden in plain sight within the movies. As always, all images that we discuss can be viewed on my website and my Instagram page in the highlights. And I really do hope that you enjoy this episode. Nicole and I had loads of fun researching and recording it a few weeks ago, just after Christmas. So just sit back and relax as Nicole and I discuss famous art cameos in the movies. So a little bit different today, and this was actually a listener's request, like I've probably said in the introduction, but we're going to do it the very much the same way that we did when Nicole was on for our conspiracies and beefs and controversies, which was episode 10. So if you haven't listened to that, I would highly recommend that you go back and have a wee listen to it. It's really interesting and quite entertaining, if we say so ourselves. But today, Nicole and I are going to be looking at great art that has been included within movies quite it's been really interesting actually and obviously this is we've recorded this just after christmas this is january 2021 and some of these are actually with movies that i watched over christmas and that i've seen them or having like gone back and rewatched them after sort of completing an art history degree i was like oh there's such and such and such and such so nicole as my gift would you like to get the ball rolling so what is your first artwork that you're gonna so the film first film i'm gonna talk about is the titanic so the scene where this painting is featured actually has a lot more artwork in it not just this piece okay so jack and rose enter rose's suite and there is a picasso there's a dega and there is a monet and the monet piece is a part of the water lily series okay quick info on monet Monet, or Claude Monet, was a French painter born in the 1840s and was one of the founders of Impressionism. And this Water Lily series is probably a great, I guess, idea of what Impressionism was. It was the study of things throughout time of the day and the same kind of subject matter, Expressionism. So, trying to find the exact one that was in the movie is difficult because there's 250 paintings done over 24 years within this Water Lily series. Right, just a very nice casual amount there from... Yeah, it was was great fun to research and trying to figure out which one it corresponded with. There's a website that tells you about art that's in movies. Okay. um, And it said that this was one of the ones that was done in 1905. But when I looked at the ones in 1905, it didn't match what was in the movie. It just didn't look the same. So, yeah, that was a fun fun time for me. So I'm going to kind of go with a loophole because I can't figure out which one it is. I'm going to talk about the actual series itself. Well, yeah, I think that's, that's perfectly reasonable. I think that's fair. I think you'll allow that of me. So, Monet painted these, as I said previously, for 24 years. So that was between 1896 to 1920. And it was of the water lilies that were that was in his garden. Something that I do really love because I was able to see the all 250 paintings within the series was the evolution of Monet and his changing styles and how he studied like the evolution of time, evolution of colour and I guess different locations within the garden mm-hmm. in Giverny. Monet bought this garden in 1893 Um, And it also featured a Japanese bridge, which is also within the subject matter as well. But the one that's in the Titanic just focuses on 
the lilies themselves. Yeah. Because the bridge is, is quite iconic and it's, he built it himself, the bridge, I'm fairly certain. Yeah, I think so. And that was the first one of the series had the bridge. Oh, okay. So, and that was like the one that was done in 1890s. Oh, okay. There we are. Also within the series is a diverse of size of how he painted it. So the smallest is 46 centimetres by 56 centimetres. And the largest goes up to 200 centimetres by 1,700 centimetres. And that's the one that's like the big panels. And you can see it within like exhibits where it takes up a full room. In 1908, Claude Monet even said, uh, these landscapes of water and reflection have become an obsession. And you can see that as the series progresses, that's when he starts to focus more on the water itself rather than with the bridge. Okay. That's when he kind of removed away from it. Um, the series, like, obviously, because there's 250 of them, so there's a mixture of it being in private collections, but it's also, like, in America, Japan, Moscow, mm -hmm. um, and then also Paris. So, literally, the series is all over the world, so if anyone wants to see it, they probably are pretty close to one. I don't know if there's one in Scotland, is there? I mean, the Borough Collection has a really fantastic collection of... Impressionist paintings, and as does the National Gallery, actually. So the I don't know if there's a, a Water Lilies one, but I'm pretty sure there's a Haystack yeah. series because Monet, for people that don't know, obviously one of the sort of key figures of Impressionism, but he had a real sort of love of series, and the whole concept of Impressionism was focusing, like Nicole said, on the effects light had on every day. And they constantly return to the same subject, you know, in the morning, noon, night, different seasons, because the subject, even though it was the same haystack or pond with water lilies or cathedrals, is a really lovely series of cathedrals as well, it completely changes depending on the light. And time of, yeah, and the seasons and Yeah, absolutely. Like it, and it, they look completely different. And yeah. it's really the sort of key component of Impressionism the effects light has on an object or thing or place. Yeah, because before, within that time period, it was like very biblical realism. They painted indoors. Exactly, exactly. So the Impressionists really sort of broke away from what was considered academic style and traditional. So like Nicole said, very, the sort of higher echelons of painting, so the higher and sort of approved categories of the art academy, and it was also developments as well in things like paint. So for the first time, paint was produced in smaller tubes and there was also um, portable easels that had been invented. So it meant that the Impressionists could leave, or artists, not just the Impressionists, could leave their studios and study outside. And this is known as en plein air. Hmm, didn't know that. I knew some of it because of higher art, but yeah, but that's it. That's As there were 250 of the series, I was unable to... You know. And we won't be too sad that we've lost one yeah. now in the Titanic. <laughs> oh, here, I was meant to say, uh, obviously, James Cameron was wrong. It was never on the Titanic. There were famous artists that were on the Titanic and art was lost. Yeah. But Monet was not one of them. But, and even you'd said the Picasso one wasn't correct. Yeah, so there's a Picasso in the scene as well. The name escapes me, but it's... It's probably one of his best known, and as an art historian, I should really know the name of this. It's already like been six, doing a or, <laughs> six or seven um, sort of very angry looking women, and yeah. it's actually about an eighth of the size of the actual canvas. This will be the one where I'll be like, I'll be lying in bed tonight and be like, oh my gosh, it's called that. <laughs> um, but anyway, yes, yeah, so there's, I would definitely say check out because I completely forgot about that scene that she has all these. Yeah, there was a deleted scene where she like goes round and she talks about them all, and then um, I can't remember the uh, the bad guy's name. Oh, her her fiance. Her fiance, and he basically says like it's stupid, and then she's like, "My taste in art is superior," and that's the issue. And then she has the Dega. So the Dega is actually in the background. So as the Dega or Money? No Dega. So the Dega with the ballerina dancing. Okay. So that one is in the back. So I'd mentioned previously that there was a Picasso, a Dega, and a Money. Right. So the day guys in the back, but the only reason why I knew to look out for it was because I'd seen the the deleted scene. And then you've got the Picasso on one side and that. But she always talked, like, I think the day guy was her favourite. See, so the day guy that she has is called the star. Is this that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
the star and it's a really really interesting piece actually and we'll i'll put a link to is the deleted scene the available del yeah, online? yeah it's on youtube i've got them both amazing so we'll put a link in the description below to the deleted scene but the star is it's actually my favorite dega painting it's this solo ballerina sort of taking her turn on the stage and it seems to be a really innocent scene but you can see into the wings of backstage and there's a gentleman standing there and this is the thing about Dega there's a whole real sort of twisted history behind the ballerinas that he used to paint because Ooh. these were these were young girls so they were 14 15 and they were taken into the ballet they were trained up but as a way of getting extra money they were also prostitutes no. and the dance teachers would allow gentlemen to come back and select their dancers and the gentleman standing in the wing is believed to be her suitor for the evening so there's a real dark that but it's a paint. i know but it's a be <laughs> but it's a beautiful it's it's painting gorgeous. it's incredible and like we said we'll leave a link down in the description below so yeah that's the titanic and money water lilies part 500? In part 500 of, <laughs> yeah, he really, really prolific, constantly making, constantly painting and up to obsessive levels. But I think for any artist, though, you can't really switch off. Yeah. And it was even, it, that was towards the end of his career, mm. that or before he passed. Mm. And towards the end of the series, that's when he had cataracts in yes, his uh -huh. eye. So it's quite interesting because when you see the chronological, how they were created. Mm hmm you can see that he's getting a bit looser, the colour's getting a bit faded, and it's getting a bit more abstract. Ah, okay. So, it's not said, but it could be because that's how he actually saw it, so he was starting to paint how he saw it. That's so interesting. Hmm. Oh, well, thank you. So that's... Painting one. Titanic. So I'm going to do something, I'm going to speak about a, a film, or a work of art in a film, that's completely polar opposite to that. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to talk about a famous sculpture by a British artist that makes a very fabulous cameo appearance in the 1995 iconic teen drama movie, Clueless. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you told me Clueless had one, I was quite shocked. I know. But that's... <laughs> it's, so I rewatched Clueless during lockdown like any normal human being my age. Iconic. Um, and it's so it's such a feel good movie. I absolutely love Clueless. But what I was really surprised at is, like, about an hour into the movie, Cher shows round her love interest, Christian, and he sh she's showing him around the house, and they go out into the garden, and they have all these. They're complete knockoffs, of course, but for the purposes of the movie, they they're obviously pretending to be real. Yeah. But he has like Giacometti's, Michelangelo's. He has a really famous um, sculpture by an American artist called Klaus Oldenburg. And Klaus, and it's a it's a sort of fag end that's been stabbed down. And Klaus is a really he's actually Swedish, but he's a very very famous sculptor in America. And her expression is hold on, let me find it, what it says here. Oh yes, yeah, so um the gen that Chris her sort of love interest that she's showing around the sculpture, he and he's remarking that, oh the dad your dad's got a really great collection and he's like, Oh, you've got a Klaus Oldenburg and she's like, Yeah, he's like way famous. <laughs> um which is just classic clueless chat. It has that iconic line as as if I just <laughs> love it. It's so good. And what they stumble across is or what they make a point in talking about at great length is a sculpture by Henry Moore. So Henry Moore is by far one of Britain's best known sculptors. He was born in York in 1898 and he's best known for his semi-abstract sculptures which can be found all over the world. Moore stands out amongst his contemporaries as not only due to his iconic style but he was one of Britain's first artists to really gain global acclaim during his lifetime. So he's a really, really interesting person. So the particular piece that they have in their collection is called Reclining Figure. I must say it's a very sort of, if you compare the two together, there's slight differences in sort of the length of the neck or whatever, but it's it's definitely a Henry Moore. And this particular piece, Reclining Figure, was commissioned actually for the Festival of Britain by the Arts Council. And this was one of Moore's most famous pieces throughout his life. 
and it's very iconic and a very excellent example of Moore's sort of artistic aesthetic style. So the Festival of Britain, just to give you a little bit of context, was held six years after the end of World War II and it aimed at promoting a feeling of recovery within Britain. And the Festival of Britain opened up to the public in May 1951. And it celebrated British art and scientists. So they went about commissioning all these sculptures, all these incredible displays of British engineering, science developments. And it was really just to symbolise regeneration and regrowth and sort of finding Britain, finding its feet again after being completely decimated in the war. Because you have to remember, this was actually at the time, 1951, wartime rationing in Britain was mm-hmm. still happening and wartime rationing didn't end until about 53, 54 something, something along those lines so yeah, it's a really interesting time in Britain and everyone's you know, the economy's just sort of starting to get kick-started again and Henry Moore was approached by the British um, Arts Council and asked to make this piece. So during the making of the work, the BBC filmed Moore in his studio and captured the entire process, so from the concept to making his maquette. So a maquette is a very small model of what will eventually be the large piece. Mm -hmm. So from his sort of inception of the idea, making the maquette, and then eventually into sort of fabricating the real life thing. And initially, the Arts Council asked Moore to make something in plaster or in stone and then they decided because it was going to be outside that Moore really sort of pushed for it to be cast in bronze which it was. So as I said this was all being recorded and when the programme broadcast in April 1951 a few days before the festival officially opened it was actually the first time British television showed an arts programme about a living artist in Britain. Oh, right. So it was really pioneering and really exciting. And the festival lasted for five weeks. And like I said, there was a lot of artworks that were commissioned. And some have fallen into obscurity. We don't really know where we've went. But luckily for us, we know where this original cast is. Mm. And it's very close to our home turf. It's in Edinburgh. Sure, really? It is. It's in Edinburgh. So it's outside the modern one, which is an art gallery in Edinburgh. And you can go and see it. It's completely free. It's outside. So if you're listening to this in Edinburgh, and this will be coming to you during lockdown, where we're we're in lockdown (laughs) 3.0 at the moment. Who knows by the time this comes, but it'll be out soon anyway. Anyway, so it's out. So it's outside at the Modern Gallery of Art in Edinburgh, which is really, really exciting, um, particularly that it's a very nice sort of drawback to Scotland. Mm -hmm. What's even more interesting, there is also a copy of it in the Tuileries Gardens, an addition rather, in the Tuileries Gardens, which is the gardens just outside of the Louvre in Paris. Oh, another close to home for us. Another close to home for us. Our sister lives in Paris. (laughs) Um, I would say hi, but she's definitely not listening. Yeah, she does. She's just like, oh, well, good luck, guys. Yeah, sure, whatever. <laughs> um, and for those of you who are perhaps based in London, you too can also see a cast, well, actually the cast that Henry Moore worked on in plaster in his studio, and that can be found in the Tate's collection, and that is on display permanently in the Henry Moore room in Tate Britain. So why is there three? Is it just because he did it, he made a mould? So no, could... so there's actually more. I think there's either six or eight in the series. I don't quite know the number, it's, but it's between six or eight that are in the series. So essentially he made this piece mm-hmm. and then after the piece was made, he then decided that he wanted to make it into an addition. Okay, okay. And that's why there's additions. I, don't, I can't really track where the rest of them are, but um, I only know the one about the Tuileries Garden because the last time we were in Paris... When I went for a walk, I walked through the gardens and I was like, oh, and there's a Henry Moore. And if you find yourself in Paris, the Tuileries Gardens has an incredible art collection of public sculpture just out there for free to wander around in. So there you are. So that's Clueless. As if. As if. Clueless (laughs) coming all the way around to Edinburgh and Paris. So there you are. That's nice. Nice how we can always bring it home. Absolutely. eh? Well, try and bring your next one home. That's the... (laughs) Frozen! (laughs) (laughs) Actually, it's cold out here. So it's cold here, and we're going to talk about Frozen. <laughs> Ooh, it's chilly outside. Elsa? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, back to my acting skills. Right, this is not the exact piece, 
But once again, the way I wrote this out was completely different from you. Um, I wrote the scene and then I'll bring down the That's <laughs> okay. So we're setting the scene, people, for the one person out there that hasn't seen Frozen. Well, there, there's probably the 1% that hasn't. Of course. No, I'm kidding. So this is when Anna is singing for the first time in forever. And she enters a room that is a gallery. And obviously these paintings are made so that she can interact with them to kind of produce the narrative or progress the narrative and one of the ones that she interacts with is by jumping on a sofa and then recreating what the I guess subject matter is doing which is being on a swing okay so this is actually taken from the swing painted in 1767 and it was actually a private commission for an aristocrat who wanted the piece painted of his mistress. Oh. Yes, on a swing. So he originally presented the commission as he wanted to be in the bushes mm -hmm. underneath the swing to look up the mistress's skirt, raunchy, and that a bishop is controlling the swing in the back. So Fragonard actually didn't like this because of his background of painting... Um, quite big biblical historical pieces. Oh, right, okay. So this, he didn't like the idea, so what he ended up doing was pushing the bishop more to the back and making the bishop just an older gentleman controlling the swing. Okay. So that was the original narrative, but he didn't like it. So as I previously mentioned, Fragonard was known for large-scale pieces, either biblical or mythology, French mythology, mm -hmm. um, very smooth, very detailed pieces. Okay. But academic. Academic, yeah. Very. Traditional yes. within that time. But what he realised was that he could actually make more money doing private commissions for aristocrats. So this then changed the style of how he worked. Oh. So if you look at the piece, it's very playful. Obviously, there's lots of like connotations of like sexuality and promiscuity. The swing is this quite... It's, Compared to what you normally did, it was small. Mm. Um, so it depicts a woman on a swing and she's wearing this pink, baby pink dress. It's very frilly. Um, and she's surrounded by like lush greenery. It's all very deep greens. And around them are sculptures that also depict promiscuity. Oh, okay. So there's a statue of a cherub. I can't remember the actual name of the piece, but it's like covering it. It's, it's kind of saying like... Sh got his like finger to its mouth because mm -hmm. obviously it's kind of emphasised that she's a mistress this is an affair like they aren't really meant to be together type thing mm -hmm. and then at the bottom of that sculpture there's m nymphs which in okay. Greek mythology very much associated with sexuality and then there's a fountain that has a cherub on a fish and the cherub is obviously to do with love like kind of cupid oh okay yeah so because this was a commission Fragonard had to work quickly this is why, if you look at the piece, I think this is why there's a lot of motion in the piece. So there's quick brush strokes for the bushes and stuff like that. And then the details within her dress, like, it's just very much expressive. So the style's Rococo and it was, it was a dated style within that time. So he kind of brought it back. So the palette used is obviously to emphasise the mistress. She is the main subject matter. She is a bright pink and contrasting with the green background. And even the two gentlemen kind of camouflage yeah. into the piece as well. So the person controlling the swing, he's like, you can see him, but obviously you're not meant to. Mm. The whole point is this piece was made to kind of celebrate this mistress, which I think is quite quite beautiful mm. it is amazing though i didn't i didn't know she was a mistress because like, mm. i know this painting within the context of art history is so iconic but i didn't actually know very much about it mm -hmm. yeah so that's why they use like a lot of warm tones on her to make her more kind of appealing and you want to be with her maybe sort of morally mute or mute sort of the moral connotations of it i don't i don't know I don't I, I don't know. I just think it's a really nice homage. And I don't even think the person looking up the skirt is not really looking up his skirt or looking up her skirt. He's offering his hat. Oh, is he? Mm hmm So that's... He wanted to originally to be looking up the skirt, but... Fragonard was... Fragonard didn't really want to do that because he was quite traditionally trained. Okay. So he changed it so that he was offering the hat. And 
the reason and also a part of it that's really sweet and it also kind of emphasizes the motion in the piece is her shoes flying off oh yeah so that's the idea of like the undressing mm, okay because it's like a, a luscious affair basically but i want to go back to the frozen version Okay. Because I got some. I was going to say, it's a very sort of like risky... Well, that's the whole... So it's a really risky piece, but obviously Frozen's version is actually quite different. Very PC. So, very <laughs> PC. So Frozen's version is... It's weird. So this, the swing there originally is portrait. Okay. But in Frozen, it's landscape. Mm -hmm. The subject matter is the same. It's a girl on a swing and she's wearing a pink dress and there's someone behind her, but he's closer and he's pushing the swing. So it's not this idea of like hidden affair someone kind of in the shadows watching but someone is pushing this person on the swing mm, okay frozen's one is basically a, just a bit more intimate rather than sexual because the whole point is anna's singing about possibly meeting someone that she wants to fall in love with mm -hmm. not do the horizontal boogie but a weird fact was in 2010 the concept art for tangled they recreated the swing and put rapunzel in it and they recreated it basically like exactly so they had Rapunzel in the pink dress kicking off the shoe and her hair is really long, but they don't have men in it. And it's the same people that did Tangled, did Frozen. Oh, wow. But also, do you know that Rapunzel is in Frozen? Where? So when they're walking over the bridge for the inauguration, you see Flynn and Rapunzel. So I think this was just a kind of little like Easter egg nod oh, okay. to the work that they did because Rapunzel was the first 3D. Because as um. Oh, Rapunzel was the first 3D Disney. Yeah, not 3D Pixar. Pixar, right, lovely. Because Pixar are so famous for putting in little Easter eggs and sort of clues. So I think this was them kind of doing a homage to 3D animation that Pixar kind of paved the way for. Right, okay, wow. Yeah, and you can also see the swing in the Walls Collection in London. So yes, you can, yeah. which is free to get into. So again, if anyone is based in London or once the world decides to work again, <laughs> Um, finds himself in London, the Walls Collection. is actually just off of Oxford Street. It's a really incredible collection. And it's got some absolute corkers, a lot of uh, Valanquezes as well, which um, really sort of bowled me over. Valanquez, this was the court painter to King Philip IV. Mm. And he was essentially also his curator and is responsible for a lot of the works of art that are in the Prado in Madrid. Mm. But yeah, so that's the swing. Although not the exact one that was in Disney, but I really recommend looking at it. It's such a gorgeous piece. And I really, like, obviously Disney had to make it PC, but even look at the Rapunzel concept art one. Um, It's it's just so beautiful. And yeah, it's probably, which we can, if you send me a link yeah, to that. Yeah, book, I can, I can show you the contrast. So yeah, that's my second film. Nice. It's just, oh, honestly such a great painting we are continuing kind of with a sort of frozen chilly theme and the next Good painting connection. thank you the next work of art that i'm going to talk about is in probably one of my all-time favorite feel-good movies and that is the holiday that's a good Christmas one. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. So probably when this goes out, it will be in the end of January. So most most Christmas people is over. <laughs> most people probably have rewatched the holiday at some point within the last sort of four to six weeks. So I'm gonna set the scene for you in the holiday. So as you know, the this is all about sort of a, a house swap mm -hmm. and sort of um sort of two worlds entwining. So this is Iris, who is the British journalist. She goes to Amanda's house in, well, America somewhere. This is LA, I think. Is it LA? Well, because it's like film production, maybe. So yeah. I just assume. I don't think it is. Anyway, Iris is in Amanda's house in America and she has been sent pages from her sort of love interest slash rat. Oh my goodness, what's his name? I don't know. Jasper. Um, sent sort of pages from her love interest slash rat Jasper and she sort of lies down to read the pages and he calls her and he says I've got a surprise for you it's at the front door and as she runs down Amanda's staircase there is this incredible work on paper by the iconic American artist Robert Langle. Now Robert 
Lango is an American artist, filmmaker and musician and first became known for his series called Men in the Cities. And it's a drawing and print series which shows sharply dressed men and women kind of writhing around in sort of uncontrolled emotions. Mm -hmm. But not in a way that they look in pain. They there's, there's something really intriguing about them. And essentially, when Iris runs down the stairs, you get a shot of one of these, one from one of these works from within the series. So it's of men and women, and they're all very sort of sharply dressed. So the series was released in 1980, and the work, although sort of first appears to be a photograph, it's actually charcoal and pencil which is incredible when you get a really good look at it because just from the fleeting image you probably think oh it's, it's a really lovely photograph yeah that's what I thought it was when you showed me yeah but it's it's charcoal on paper it's incredible and, and the artist actually studied to become a sculptor but he ended up sort of really falling in love with photography and drawing and all sorts of other things mm -hmm. and sort of applied his sort of sculpting techniques that he learned when he was at university to how he sort of moulds and sculpts but instead of using 2D. clay he does it in 2D it's amazing so like I said the series was first released and well, well, the series was released in 1980 and each work in the series is untitled and there's about 60 of these pieces mm. the series depicts men and women in formal clothing and in different states of emotion like I said, most of them are untitled, are called untitled, but it will say untitled and then in brackets it will say Eric. Mm. And the one that appears to be in, I couldn't find it exactly, but there is one, I think she's called Harriet. You're able to find your piece. Something, it, it's not exactly. <laughs> exactly, so it's the same. The same. Do you think they do that for copyright? Potentially, well, actually, what I what I read was that this house is an actual house mm -hmm. that obviously the, the owners have just sort of rent, rented out to film in. So I'm not too sure if that piece is as original, but I definitely think they have to sort of copyright. Uh, who knows? Anyway, so and actually, one of the things that I found out is that of all the untitled women, one of the women is called Jo. Nice. So Joe. obviously, that's my favorite. <laughs> um. So. For the series, Longo photographed his friends sort of lurching forward and collapsing forward and sort of making them sprawl onto invisible tables and things mm. like that. And then what he and a studio assistant did was enlarge these photos using a projector and then they drew them in all different sizes ranging from sort of three-quarter scale to larger than life size. And in the process, Longo often dramatised the poses and the sort of sort of standard mode of dress is sort of business business attire, um, sort of very sort of sharply dressed men in suits and women in sort of very beautiful sort of pencil suits mm -hmm. and very elegant dresses as well. It's a really, really beautiful series and all the images are in black and white. That, that should really emphasise that. And it was actually inspired by a film called The American Soldier Ooh. by a director called Reiner Fassbender. Longo produced about 60 pieces within the series, not touching on Monet's 200 nod, 50 but noise. still still a fairly good, a fairly good whack. <laughs> a good run for his money. Absolutely. <laughs> and um between and these were produced between sort of 1979 to 1982-83. They're very iconic and, like I said previously, they really put Longo on the map and made his name as an artist very, very young. So by the time he was 30, he was one of the most widely publicised, exhibited and collected artists of the 1980s, along with the likes of Cindy Sherman, who, again, is an incredibly iconic female photographic artist and Longo and Sherman were actually in a relationship for quite a few years as well. Saucy. So yeah well I think it's be interesting to see how they sort of influenced each other but um, Longo kind of not fell out of favour after that art scene wise but I think everyone has had that thing where they were sort of like oh he's kind of peaked too soon. Yeah. But as well as painting, Longo's also had a really successful career in filmmaking and he's also a musician. Mm. And he's actually, or was married to a German, a very famous German 
film star for quite a long time. And in 2009, the Met Museum had an exhibition based around this series of paintings. So if you go onto that website, you can you can find more about the series and about uh, Robert Longo himself. It's really funny, I'd never actually heard of Robert Longo until during the summer, mm -hmm. and it was one of my colleagues at work that had mentioned him, because I was looking for a series on my Instagram all about sort of black and white art. Yeah. And it was one of my colleagues that said, oh, well, you should have a look at, a look at uh, Robert Longo. Anyway, he is incredible, and we'll leave a link to his website and stuff in the notes below. But... And a very sort of polar opposite sort of theme to the holiday. These paintings, or two from the series of Men in the City from Robert Longo, also appear in another very iconic, very different movie, American Cycle. I thought it would be that and it would make sense with the businesses. But yeah, that, God, that's... You think so? Well, yeah, because the whole idea... Well, I still don't understand American Psycho. I've, you know, tried to read analysis on it. I still Do you don't... know, I haven't watched it in forever. Like, I watched it, I think, when I was about 17 or 18. You know, you go, you go through that stage where you're like, like... I want to be edgy. Yeah, absolutely. You know, cult classic sort of thing. <laughs> and then you're like, I don't understand these cult classics. Because <laughs> I even... I tried to read it as well. Did you? And I just was like, I, I don't... Because it... No... I tried to read that and also A Clockwork Orange. I was trying to be super edgy. Oh my god, I love A Clockwork Orange. But the book is it's like a made up language. Yeah, it's crazy. And I was like, nope. It's so actually, I saw it in the theatre, at the Citizens Theatre in Glasgow. I thought, oh my gosh, I think like 2010, 2011, it was bonkers. Yeah, but obviously, even like American Psycho, I still don't understand the ending. Was it real? Was it not real? I can't even remember the ending. Let's not ruin it. Maybe, yeah, maybe no spoilers. I'll have to, no spoilers. Yeah. Just the question is: Is it real? Is it not real? Enjoy that cliffhanger. <laughs> so it's time for the last film. So this last film I'm going to talk about is actually one that we did a failed attempt at the marathon. Yeah, we did. We did fail it. But, <laughs> yeah, we did um, fail. We were quite tired. I think it was like four, well, it's it's an extensive amount of movies to try and cram into a day. So it was Harry Potter, and the piece that I'm talking about features in the Half Blood Prince. And that is Unicorn in Captivity. I think it also appears quite a few times. So this is what I thought. People at home didn't see me. I shook my head because I've learned a lot about this piece. <laughs> There's seven tapestries in total. Okay. And it depicts, essentially it's like a hunt of a unicorn. Okay. And the last one, the Unicorn in Captivity, is kind of separated from the series. It doesn't look anything like the rest of them. But okay. I'll get into that when I do. But the... A lot of the tapestries are actually in different dorm rooms and it's decorated throughout the castle. So you do see all seven. Oh, do you? They're just featured throughout different locations That's of amazing. the castle. So we should say, um, I don't think Nicole mentioned, that the piece that we're talking about is, there's a close-up of it in the Gryffindor common room. No. <laughs> no? <laughs> no. The one in the Gryffindor common room is the unicorn at the fountain. So this is um, this big, massive tapestry, red lady standing with the unicorns around her. The one that I am discussing is featured in The Half-Blood Prince, and you see it when Jenny takes Harry to the Room of Requirements. They stand before it, and I believe the Room of Requirements is hidden behind the tapestry. Oh! So do you remember they're standing hand in hand? And then she yes. Goes, you ready? And then <laughs> not your best Jenny Weasley impression. Not best Jenny Weasley. <laughs> Can't See? believe you never got that part. Uh, I've got it. <laughs> this tapestry I will describe is when I say giant, I mean giant. It's a tapestry, so we all know sizes. Um, and it depicts I. <laughs> We all know sizes. We all know sizes. Tap tapestry size. Tapestry. You've got the small, medium, large tapestry. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, um, so the unicorn in captivity is a large tapestry, and it depicts a unicorn encaged in a circular fence and chained to a tree, and it's just surrounded by wild flowers. It was created between fourteen ninety five and fifteen o five. No one knows exactly who created the series okay but what they do know is that it comes from like northern europe so like paris france so the tapestries are made with fine wool and silk and it's naturally dyed with flowers so wild for the yellow madder for the red and wood for the blue so it was a part of a series and it depicts the hunt of a unicorn so number one is called the start of the hunt two is the unicorn at the fountain number three is the unicorn attacked Four, the unicorn defending himself. Five, the unicorn captured by the virgin. 
six, the unicorn killed and brought to the castle, and seven, the unicorn in captivity. So basically, when I said that I believe people are reaching, it's because they, <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing, they believe that this is to, this depicts the story of Jesus being hunted by the Romans. So each piece, each tapestry is basically kind of crucifixion. Oh, wow. Obviously, I'd need to get all seven up, but yeah. So basically, it like starts, it's weird. I'd need to kind of jump about. So within mythology, the only way you could see a unicorn is if you were a young virgin and a female. That was the only people that could see unicorns. Oh, wow. Okay. So if you were to ever hunt a unicorn, it had to be by a woman. So within these pieces, it's depicted with tons of men and like dogs. So within mythology sense, they would not be able to hunt a unicorn. Yeah. So that's why they believe the kind of it's connected to Jesus and the people, the men are the Romans and the unicorn is Jesus, and it depicts obviously the different stages of the crucifixion, and the captured by the Virgin is Mary. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously, so the sixth tapestry, the unicorn is killed. That's obviously the whole point is the hunt, and then in the seventh one, it's alive again, which is seen as the resurrection of Jesus. And obviously, when not that Jesus was content when he came back, mm. but he kind of then that kind of confirmed his place. Because do you remember, like when he went to the garden and he was like, and he questioned God, like, why do I need to die, basically? And then obviously he was like, and he must have just been like, it's my time. I kind of get it. This is biblical studies with Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so basically, and so I now can describe the piece a bit better. So the fence that surrounds the unicorn is actually low enough for it to escape. And the chain that it's connected to the tree Mm -hmm. is actually loose enough for it to break. So it's almost depicting the contentment of it being captured, like it's happy with it. Oh, that's so interesting. I just kind of want to point out before you go on, art historically, this is a really important tapestry. It's incredibly important and very, very iconic, which is why when we watched it, I said to you, oh my God, that tapestry is really famous. Yeah, it's also been featured in like a million other things. For me, the first time I'd actually ever seen it was within The Last Unicorn, the animated film in 1982. Um, I recommend the film, it's very beautiful. But in the intro scene, like with the kind of title screen, it goes over this tapestry in different scenes. It's been featured in books, it's been featured It's been featured in loads of films and TV shows and stuff like that. Can you give us a few? It was featured in Spider-Man, Far From Home, Rumpelstiltskin's Once Upon a Time, that's a TV series. Okay. It's been in Adventure Time, which is an animation. It's been in Family Guy, which was an animation. Ghost of a Girlfriend Past, which was an awful film. The Secret, <laughs> <laughs> the Secret Garden, 1993. Oh, wow. That's a good film. We enjoy that. It's been in books. So Annie on the Mind. <laughs> Can you tell she's reading this off a wiki? <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's been featured in quite a few things. So within the series, one to six, very much realistic. The flowers correlate to where it would be in a scene. So if it's like a meadow, the flowers are meadow flowers. If it's a forest, the flowers are forest flowers. It's very, you know, there's like scenery almost. Mm. Like, yeah, there's a break in the skyline and stuff like that. It's very compressed, full of people. But this is the only one that it's completely flat. Yeah. And it's very surreal when you kind of see them all lined up together. The tree that the unicorn is attached to is a pomegranate tree. Oh. The leaves of the tree don't match a pomegranate tree. That's so interesting. It's a pomegranate tree. So, and there's also like a variation of flowers that are like in the meadow and the forestry kind of flowers within that era, like within that era of France. Um, when it was created. So with the um, the kind of imagery used within that is to do with fertility and marriage. So there's actual, so if you look at the piece, there's like red dots on the unicorn. Okay. But it's not actually blood, it's pomegranate juice. So the pomegranates are kind of leaking onto the unicorn. I, I don't under, I, but that's to do with like fertility and marriage. So some people also think it's to do with contentment and marriage. Like you're just kind of stuck because the unicorn could escape. 
but he can't. Well, but at he's that, choosing not to. Well, basically. at that time as well, divorce wasn't a thing then. Wasn't a thing then because it was wasn't until Henry the Eighth took the throne and he took the throne in fifteen oh nine. Hmm. And then obviously after Catherine of Aragon, who was his first wife. But why I said that was interesting is because her royal symbol was pomegranates. Oh, really? Because here's the thing. This is my theory. It would have probably been made by women, yes? Yeah, oh, 100%. And actually, probably nuns. Yeah, so, actually, that's... Because even when I'd read about the kind of... Can, kind of stuck in marriage because yeah. of the flowers and the... Pom- uh, kind of the plant life or nature that's within the piece are all to do with, like, fertility and sexuality in marriage. Well, and that's what the pomegranate symbolises. Yeah, that's, is. that's, like, one of the... Sexy fruit. And which is really interesting that also her, so Catherine of Aragon, famously her crest, like I said, was a pomegranate. And there's actually sort of examples of them still within the stonework at Hampden Court, where she and Henry lived in London. But she never bore him a son. That And, and she had a lot of phantom pregnancies and a lot of miscarriages, actually. So there was a sort of sad yeah. association with, with pomegranates because she wasn't very... Fertile, unfortunately, which well, yeah, that's which, what well, that they did use that within medieval times to kind of encourage fertility. Mm. God, that's this was also at the time when you were pregnant, you were shut up for the entire nine months. Yeah, I'd, I'd heard about this, and it was the no one was allowed to be in the room with you, you were to be like you to isolate while pregnant. Yeah, because they were just so cautious that either they would catch it or you would. I, I don't know, but yeah, you, you were alone. And then even after the birth, you were you were confined to the room for a week. Yeah. It was, yeah, horrible times. Horrible times. Anyway, but like I said, this is a really, really, really sort of interesting connections with what's going on sort of historically. Yeah, that did not even know that. That's actually so interesting. But so the tapestries were historically recreated mm-hmm. for the films. And they were done accurately because we had been to the Harry Potter studios in London and we got a little tour and that's what they told us. So they were made the same way that they would have done it. They used the same materials so that it would age the same way that it would. So the one that's in the movie, you can find it in Los Angeles in the Warner Brothers studios. Oh, nice. However, in 2002, they recreated the whole series for Sterling Castle. Um, and that um, it's the same thing. It was handmade, used the same materials. Um, very much just kind of pay a homage and then also fun fact the national animal for Scotland is the unicorn that is indeed yep most places have real well actually Wales has got a dragon are they not yeah man we were we were smart when we picked those Pfft, the lion yeah so the national animal of Scotland is the unicorn and if anyone doesn't know Stirling is in Scotland, Scotland. sorry I should have said yeah um, and it's kind of one of our bigger cities out with um, Edinburgh. Edinburgh and Glasgow. It's actually very famous for William Wallace. It's where the Wallace Monument is. It's a really beautiful city if you ever find yourself in Scotland and you don't really know how to, it's a really, you don't really know what to do of a day. Um, Stirling is very beautiful and That's very, cool. very historic. Great castle. And there's a fabulous exhibition actually showing the process because it took years and years to recreate. Yeah, yeah. Start well, starting two thousand two. And like you know. said, you know, it, um, the the use the original making techniques Technique, yeah. on, on these sort of looms to make these tapestries. Really incredible, incredible stuff. But actually, the the original piece or the original series rather was sold. Is it in America? It is. Do you know who it went to? Oh no, <laughs> no, I I. I literally was the Met. Mr. J.D. Rockefeller of the Rockefeller Centre. And it's in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. You are correct indeed. Ding, but ding, ding. what is even more impressive is that in 1923, they sold for $1.1 million. Each? The whole series, oh. which is a mind-boggling amount of money then. But that's still a lot for... Uh, no, that's a mind book. Well, I can't even imagine what that must be. And that must be billions in sort of today's terms. Crazy, absolutely crazy. But yeah, really interesting. How interesting that it, it was included in Harry Potter. It makes, it does make sense. But it's the thing I do find weird is the idea that it's connected to Jesus when Jesus is also connected to the lion. Like, why is Jesus getting all these animals? I, know, I just always think for us... How England is the lion and the unicorn's the 
unicorn and on the passport in Scotland yeah yeah sorry and I always I just always find it weird well the crest of the monarch that's mm-hmm. the crest of the house of Windsor oh, really? is the is the lion oh, yeah. and, and the unicorn but what's interesting in that is that the unicorn has changed and the lion is not yeah that's another theory I've read this theory um but something I do find interesting and this is maybe more in the mythology sense of like actual storytelling is the idea of like Jesus stories kind of like the hero's journey and then that also falls on Harry Potter, which is the hero's journey. So that's oh. when, um, obviously, the whole point is kind of the it's the groundworks of any kind of story you'll ever read. It's um the hero's journey, especially for action. But also interesting with that link with Jesus, because Harry also technically comes back to. Well, life. that's no, but this is what I was going to say. So it's like then that's one of the so it's this. I can't remember the author's name, but he basically studied every kind of myth and kind of folklore and old wife's tale and he noticed that they all had this similar pattern of someone leaves their home someone's taken away and then there's all these kind of different steps into storytelling so basically and i don't want to say harry essentially has the same life as jesus but it kind of correlates and works the same way where you know harry is taken from pivot drive Mm -hmm. it goes to hogwarts is introduced to a new world and then kind of he meets people that kind of doubts him and But he's also this like celebrity. Yeah, which is thing. what Jesus was. Essentially. You know, because people were like he's the son of God and then people doubted him. And then there was kind of, I guess, trial. Harry's trial was obviously going up against Voldemort. <laughs> Jesus went up against the Romans. <laughs> no, Jesus went up against well, well yeah, yeah Pilate. <laughs> Pil- yeah, Pompous Pilate. And both died and came back. They both resurrected. It's literally the kind of same story. It's so weird. Mm, that is so interesting. Yeah, so that's it. Had to talk about unicorns sometime and I'm glad I brought it up today, baby. Well, that's great. It's so, yeah, really, really interesting. Well, I've got absolutely no link to... <laughs> unicorns for this one. I've got no link to my next one, but it's an incredibly famous painting that I'm about to talk about, but it's also an incredibly famous movie. And really iconic scene within 80s pop culture. It's funny because you'd mentioned it and I'd literally told you the scene exactly as it happened and you were like watching it or like it was like screenshots and you were like yep that's exactly yep, what that's what's happening. <laughs> okay so the piece that I'm going to be talking about is A Sunday on Le Grand Jat which is by a, the sort of post-impressionist painter George Seurat and it's most it's, it's Seurat's most famous painting. It's his largest by far. But where in the movies where it comes into is that very iconic scene in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, where Ferris and his girlfriend and his friend Cameron go to the museum. I think it's the Chicago Institution. That's where they are, and they sort of go around um, the. They sort of go around the exhibits and you see there's hundreds of art in this sort of section. So just from watching it, there's Patrick Heron, Medigliani, there's a Jackson Pollock, Mary Cassatt. There is another Moore reclining figure. I was very chuffed with that. So linking again <laughs> to Clueless. I wonder if that was the one that they borrowed. Who knows? <laughs> it might just be a fake name. Um, Picasso's, Monet's, Degas, and a really incredibly beautiful Marc Chagall window stained glass window really beautiful and there's actually a very nice sort of juxtaposition while um ferris and his girlfriends are ha- is having a very sort of intimate sort of kiss um in front of the chagall it keeps sort of flicking back to cameron sort of staring more and more and more and more intently into Seurat's painting and the whole why this painting is so important is because it was really the first time he kind of like hammered down his technique of what we now call pointillism which is the application of applying hundreds and hundreds of tiny dots of colour side by side. And this technique is known as the science of optical mixture. So why he did this was because essentially, very going back again to the whole idea of uh, studying sort of traditionally in the academy. So um, Surah himself actually came from a very well-off family he studied at an incredibly famous art institution in Paris called Ecole de Beaux Arts 
and um, when he graduated he really didn't resonate with sort of the traditional stylings and teachings which were very much hammered into you and like Nicole was mentioned previously it's that sort of biblical large-scale moral depictions which really saturated the history of art and it was when the Impressionists and people like Monet and Degas and you know that sort of crowd came along and really sort of pushed something a different narrative and Sura although he enjoyed what the impressionists were doing he himself was trying to sort of break free and come up with his own sort of style and take on things Mm -hmm. and how he applied colour he was completely obsessed with it so the whole idea of science of optical mixture is when you are traditionally painting so for example you have your primary colours your Mm -hmm. three primary colours which are red yellow blue yes Thank you for looking at me there and improving the artist. I, the way you kind of, you looked as if you're like, what are they? And I was like, come on, Joe. <laughs> come on, primary <laughs> colours, which are your primary colours, which are red, yellow, blue. And however you mix your primary colours. So for example, if you mix blue and red together, you will get purple. But it's all about, like we said previously, the Impressionists were all about the studying the effects of light on objects and colour and also working out during the day and although he was a post-impressionist that's exactly what Seurat was also really interested in but instead of mixing colours on a palette to to get a green or a purple or a brown what the science optical mixture is and what pointillism is essentially is instead of mixing these colours you place pure red and pure blue very very closely together and it's an optical illusion. So when, you, when you're when you up close, it doesn't make any sense. But once you're a few steps back from the painting, your eyes, as an optical illusion, run everything together. And it's really, really interesting. And that's essentially what happens in this scene as Cameron looks at this. He kind of focuses in on the little girl that's in the middle of the painting. He's, and he sort of zooms in and further in and further in and further in. And, and they're kind of like, he's almost kind of locked eyes with this small girl. Um, and the scene is essentially what the painting is all about. It's this lovely um, island in the middle of the Seine in Paris, and I've actually been there. It's incredible, and a lot of the Impressionists used to paint there as well. And when you go there today, there's um, there's plaques the whole way along the waterfront that tell you this is where Monet sat to paint this, this is oh. where they sat to paint here. And what's really impressive is how the landscape's changed yeah. because it's right by what essentially is the equivalent of um, the financial district of Paris so it's very near La Défense which is the finance district and sort of the equivalent to that in London for example is Canary Wharf um, so it's where all the big bank headquarters are it's really really interesting to see like if you look at these examples in the boards that are on this little island really beautiful scenes and it's, it's a place where people still do come actually to sort of relax and do sport and this is essentially what's happening in this painting it's a really really hot day and it's hot parisian summer and it's very sort of well to do sort of middle to upper class people kind of standing and sort of looking at the water there's a, there's a real sort of stillness to the piece and there's not a lot of movement but i think he's just trying to sort of encapsulate when you have those sort of very hot, so almost kind of sticky days where it's almost too hot to move. Yeah, yeah. I mean, being from Scotland, we've not had too many of them, yeah, but when, when they do happen, when it goes above 16 degrees, we can relate. <laughs> we panic. We panic, we do. Um, So this painting, well, it was painted in the 1880s, so between 1884 and 1886, and measures over two metres by three metres. It's a huge, huge piece. And something that I learned while researching for this podcast is that although the work is framed, it's Surat himself himself has actually painted a coloured frame around the piece of the painting. And it's a mixture of all these. Hold on, let me get it up. So you're looking at it. So if you look here, the whole way around the piece, there is a very light border. And this border is incredibly colourful and it doesn't. So it's. It's blues and reds and greens and all sorts of things like that. And that's essentially so when your eyes meet the outer point, it provides a contrast to the yeah. to the to the colour that you're looking at. It's really, really interesting. Because I would even say that it 
compliments it like you're not drawn to the frame it kind of just makes you go back to look at it but no that is so nice yeah but it's it's a really really interesting piece and within the context of art history completely iconic and probably one of the world's best known paintings i mean it's you probably don't know it by name but if you look on my Instagram or on the website, you'll see this and think, oh my goodness, I, I know what this is. And it actually has a twin, which is in the, well, not a twin, it has a sister painting in the series. And that's, which is taken from the other side of the bank of the sea. And so it's not in this little island, it's on the bank. And it actually depicts workers from a factory in the distance. And that's bathers at Ansea. And that is in the National Gallery at London. And it's actually probably my one of my most favourite paintings. Mm. Also huge, but doesn't kind of touch scale-wise to what uh, A Sunday on the Grand Yard does. What is really interesting in this painting is that there's a really sort of sense of sort of upper-class well-to-do-ness and it's kind of marking, you know, he's kind of recording Paris at a time when there was a great influx in wealth, obviously due to the Industrial Revolution. And... This seems to be a place where the rich and the wealthy go, but there's also sort of um, indications that all isn't so well. So if you look to the sort of left-hand side on the bank of the sea and you see two women that are fishing, which is really not a typical uh, sport for an upper-class well-to-do woman to do. You sort of, you know, you look good and, and you and you have children that's essentially what your job is at this stage in the game but these two women that are fishing are actually believed to be prostitutes and they've dressed up as a sort of rouge to get the attention of two officers which are sort of slowly working their way down the banks of the sea and making sure that everything's sort of all well to do so there's sort of a dark undertone as well to this painting which is really interesting and also the sea is completely still uh, just again sort of helping to sort of emphasise how hot this day is in Paris. It's a really beautiful painting. But like I said, going back to Ferris Bueller, it's a very iconic moment in that film. But what I would love to point out to everybody is that Cameron isn't viewing it correctly. He's too close. Mm -mm -mm. No, not even that. So when you view this painting, you're not supposed to view it straight on. Really? You're supposed to view it at a 45 degree angle. So the colours would mix better? No. Oh, because that's how it works at Resale Print. You're supposed to view it at a 45 degree angle because it's a slanting bank. Oh. And when you look at the woman, that there's a woman and a man right at the foreground to the right hand side of the painting. And they kind of, when you look at it closely, you see that their proportions in comparison to the people that are just essentially in front of them, mm -hmm. it doesn't look quite right. Yeah. All right. So I'm just showing Nicole now how it looks when, when it's at a 45 degree angle. Better? Yeah, that's mental. So I did multiple studies um, on this island and there's about 50 sort of drawings and sort of on the spot watercolours. And what Surah did, unlike the impressionists who champion sort of working on plein air out in the open, Surah made these studies so he could go back to his studio and then create this incredible masterpiece. Mm -hmm. But there you are. So an iconic piece in the movies, but alas, Cameron, you're viewing it at the wrong angle. Absolute fool. So there you are. And that brings us quite nicely to our six. And scene. And scene. Oh. Oh. oh, that was quick witted for I this was... time of night. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I was banging that one. <laughs> <laughs> thought about that 45 minutes ago as soon you were as we like, started just gonna, I was like Unseen. just going to keep it there <laughs> so there you are um, I think the last question I'm going to ask you Nicole is what is your favourite work that we've discussed I'm going to say the tapestry um, because that is in one of my favourite animated films as well it's nice that it is in a big franchise that made a big impact on my life mm, yeah no absolutely and it's a really beautiful beautiful piece um i think i don't know i thought you would say titanic dega i don't know well that's the that's in a deleted scene though isn't it <laughs> doesn't actually count do you know what i think it's kind of a tie with me for the henry moore because i love sculpture like love love particularly post-war British sculpture. I just yeah. sculpture. I just think it's delicious and you can't really get enough of it. But I also, I didn't actually know until researching for this that you're supposed to view 
Sudas a Sunday at Le Grand Jat at a 45 degree angle, which has blown my little art historian mind. Mm. And I hope it has yours as well. It blew mine. So there you are. Yeah. Nicole, thank you so much for coming on and chatting to me. And if anyone, if you've enjoyed listening to this and you would like us to do a part two. Because there are many, oh many, my goodness, many, 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 many. Oh my goodness. We literally spent so much time deciding what we were going to talk about. But yeah. then, no, we're talking about this or we're talking about this or we're talking about this. Or actually, if you feel like getting in touch or if you have a favourite work that's appeared in a film or a TV series and you would like us to talk about it in a little bit more detail, then get in touch and let us know. We'll quite happily do a part two. Yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed this. It's something that you never really think of when you watch a film is what's going on in the back. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And there you have it, the end of another episode of the Joe's Art History Podcast. Once again, I just want to thank Nicole for coming on and being so entertaining and discussing um, some famous works that have appeared within films so I hope you guys enjoyed that as well we had a lot of fun as I think you can probably tell and again if you would like a part two please do get in touch and if you've enjoyed it then please do let us know it really does mean a lot when people reach out and send us a little message to say that they enjoyed the podcast it just kind of makes it worth doing and can really lift spirits when you're feeling a little bit down and particularly at the moment when things are a little bit rough so if you've enjoyed listening to Nicole then please do let her know it it means that it does mean a lot to people if you've enjoyed the podcast please make sure that you like rate and subscribe so you will never miss another episode and it would mean a lot if you could tell people about it as well word of mouth really is the best form of advertising so if you think you know somebody that would enjoy listening to this episode please do pass it on it would mean the world to me if you're able to leave a review as well wherever you're listening to this that would also be very much appreciated as always if you would like to get in touch you can email me joesarthistory at gmail.com or you can get in touch via instagram joesarthistory and the links for both of those things will be in the description below As always, all images discussed in the podcast can be viewed on my website www.joesarthistory.com or on my Instagram, which once again is at joesarthistory. Nicole's Instagram can be found in the show notes below as well. Finally, thank you so much for listening. I really hope you learned a little something in this podcast and that you'll maybe be a wee bit more aware of some of the works of art that are hidden in plain sight in the movies. Like we said, there are literally hundreds of references throughout the history of film. It's a really, really interesting topic and we've said we have loads of fun with this one. Finally, thank you so much for listening. Um, I hope you've learned a little something. I definitely have. And I will see you next time on the Joe's Art History Podcast. Until then, keep learning and remember, art is for all. Bye.